One of the things that caused us to make that initial determination in late October and early November was the bounce that we saw in productivity because we understood at the time that, hey, it's going to force people into the soft landing camp. See, at 228% of uh, GDP, Chinese private non-financial sector debt is as high as it is in the world across all these major economies. And more importantly, um, the Chinese uh, not uh, private sector, or sorry, uh, debt service ratio at 21% uh, is much higher than all the major economies as well. At its core, what this model is trying to do is trying to figure out, the model is trying to figure out what everyone else is trying to price in. You know, it's using their own momentum against them, they being the, the folks on the other side of your trades. It's trying to figure out at the margins, what are these people trying to do across asset markets? And these are 42 of the most important markets uh, in the world. We're talking things like the move index, the CVIX, the currency volatility. To kind of track what you've been saying and and um, and and what your work is, and it is remarkably accurate. It is very helpful to get the sense of all these variables and when they're changing. And so, um, because I have been impressed with that, I'd love for our readers to hear about how did you develop this model and how does it work. Um, you started your company uh, not quite two years ago. A little bit over two years ago, almost three years in April. Yep. Okay, great. And, um, and uh, yeah, just love to hear the process and how you came up and how you wound up finding out that these variables would work and, and how often they change weightings and things like that. And, uh, and, for, and let me just say for the Darius followers out there who have joined us, um, we are Markets Policy Partners. We write a newsletter about uh, market events, um, really all financial markets and government policy. And uh, our readership uh, is is both policymakers in Washington as well as uh, as professional investors on Wall Street. And so, with that, Darius, tell us how you how you built this model. Well, uh, look, Robert, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, it's a, you guys do great work over at MPP, and I just want to say uh, thank you for having me. So, uh, you know, let's just before we even get into the, the specifics of the model, let me give you a, a quick background of how we think about market risk, because you, you, you paid us a really nice compliment, which we appreciate in terms of being generally accurate. And I think, um, you know, part of the reason that's the case is not because, you know, we have some special foresight uh, into the future more so than the average investor. What I think we do differently that's really helped us and helped our clients at 42 Macro uh, stay on the right side of market risk uh, is we're a lot more Bayesian in how we interpret uh, economic data, uh, economic statistics, and ultimately market developments. Uh, we built a, a slew of models that uh, uh, quantitative systems really uh, that allow us to constantly be absorbing data in the right manner that allows us to spot critical inflections in real time so that we can reposition our portfolios accordingly. Uh, on on average, and this is obviously you you know you can you can <laughs> average analysis averages tend to lead to average analysis all those uh, all those things, but on average, there's about three times a year where you should be materially making uh, significant changes to your portfolio. Uh, if you're going to stay on the right side of market risk and, and generally try to compound returns over time, obviously you can choose to ignore everything and just you know buy and hold and wake up in 30 years. But the reality is most of us investors aren't capable of doing that. So that's why we exist. <laughs> that's why MVP exists. That's why 42 Macro exists is to make sure that the decisions we are making are good decisions. So let me uh, let me hop let me share my screen here. And so uh, I'll just give you a brief overview into a couple of the models that we use uh, to uh, to now cast. Uh, the market regime, and then we'll talk about the weather model, which I think is the main event here uh, today, uh, which helps us understand how you know how to project that 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 current regime into the future, if at all. Um, so this is our global macro risk matrix. It's not a pretty chart for TV, but it's a very important uh, chart in terms of helping investors understand what the hell is going on across global markets. And so how this model works is we are scoring 42 different markets from the perspective of our, our volatility adjusted momentum signal. Uh, and we're scoring, not only are we scoring those markets from the perspective of the momentum signal, we are also tallying how the current momentum signal uh, is behaving relative to how the market is uh, performed. And then we're summarizing that uh, in a couple of slides. So let me just give you a quick overview of how this works. Uh, so you can kind of see it's organized by equities, volatility instruments, commodity instruments, currencies, and then rates, spreads, uh, and, and, um, and, 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 and uh, yields, et cetera. And so, for example, let's take the S&P 500, for example. The S&P is currently bullish from the perspective of its volatility adjusted momentum signal. That's what the green check mark indicates. The red X indicates the bearish. And then the uh, the exclamation point indicates it's neutral. Uh, it's historically been bullish in Goldilocks and reflation. So both of those regimes are getting a point from that current bullish FAMS uh, signal in the S&P 500. Uh, we're doing that same process across each of these 42 markets on a daily basis in order to sort of now cast exactly what 
the hell markets are thinking the, the, the economy's in or what the what are markets trying to price in. And so we summarize that here on this slide where we see 27 of those 42 markets right now are confirming of Goldilocks. 15 are confirming of reflation, five are confirming of inflation, and 16 are confirming of deflation. Uh, the risk on regimes are obviously the green ones and the, and the inflation and deflation are the risk off regimes. And so right now, 43% of the total total number of confirming markets uh, is, is is being allocated to Goldilocks. So we, we indicate Goldilocks as the top-down market regime. And generally speaking, as an investor, you want to be doing things that are in accordance with the top-down market regime. Uh, one, most of it, you, there's no real way to know how long a top-down market regime is supposed to last in real time on an ex-ante basis. So in generally speaking, particularly when you're early in a phase transition, i.e. to a new regime, you generally want to be orienting your risk around that. And so uh, what does that mean from the perspective of Goldilocks? Well, Goldilocks, you think about the key portfolio considerate considerations in that particular regime. You're talking about risk assets, 10 outperform defensive assets, high beta tends to outperform a low beta as a factor, growth tends to outperform value as a factor, mega cap growth tends to outperform dividend compounders as a factor, U.S. stocks tend to outperform international stocks, developed market um, stocks tend to outperform EM stocks, spread products typically outperform treasuries in the fixed income market, uh, short rates typically outperform the belly, which typically outperform long rates, and then high yield typically outperforms uh, investment grades. So uh, that's that's sort of how we think about market risk currently. That was definitely my experience in the equity markets when I was there forever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And again, yeah, you know, the, the 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 grid process grid stands for Goldilocks reflation, inflation, and deflation. You know they're they're named appropriately, right? You know the, the I I don't have to give you a, a litany of back tests to tell you that Goldilocks is generally going to be pro risk and, and and obviously should be taking more risk uh, in that type of regime. Uh, what what I think is the the main event here for today's discussion, uh, however, is the macro weather model because it's not only uh, enough as an investor to know what regime you're currently in. But obviously, in order to put on profitable trades, you need to have some sense of how long the current regime is going to last. And if it's about to change, what is it going to change into? Right. That's that's kind of the, that's that's what we're all trying to do as investors. Most investors don't have you know specific nomenclature or much less, you know, uh, you know, powerful tools that they're using to get to those answers. But in reality, that's what everyone's trying to do to some degree. And so we've just created a more systematic uh, process around trying to kind of kind of kind of uh, split that atom open here. So um, this right here, this this what we're showing on this page is what we call our macro weather model. This model is designed to now cast momentum across the various principles, what we consider to be the principal components uh, of macro, and it's relating that momentum back into into a rolling three month outlook uh, for the main asset classes. And so as you can see down right down here in the middle of the page, stock market signal is currently neutral. Uh, the bond market signal is currently bullish, dollar signal is neutral, commodity signal is uh, bearish, and the Bitcoin signal uh, is neutral. Uh, before we unpack uh, further, I just want to say that when you see a neutral signal on this page, what, that's a, what, that, what that signal is uh, communicating to investors is that, you know, this is just a normal time to be taking risks in this particular asset class. You should be expecting on a rolling three month forward basis, normal type of returns, normal levels of volatility. Uh, for the bond market, however, you should be expecting above median returns, below median volatility for this particular asset class beyond a certain threshold. And then inversely, conversely, the commodities, uh, you should be expecting below, well below median returns and, and much above median volatility. And, and generally speaking, that's kind of uh, what we've seen uh, really since the advent of these signals a couple of weeks ago. So I'll, I'll go down the, um, I'll pause for a second to give you opportunity to ask questions and I can just kind of uh, go down and, and further unpack how the model works. Well, you have a confidence level also line in the last chart. How does that get determined? Is that this right here? The strength of signal? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the strength of signal in this in this global macro risk matrix uh, <laughs> uh, model, which again now cast the top down marker regime, uh, that's just the percentile reading of the total amount of signal uh, in the table. So at any given time, so what we're looking for, obviously, this is sort of a, a breath process, if you will. We're using our volatility just momentum signal in the context of how these different exposures have traded historically uh, in those particular regimes to effectively create market, not only figure out what the markets are pricing in, but how much breadth is associated with pricing those things in. And so we'd say we're in a 77th percentile of breadth for, uh, for pricing in what, what markets are trying to price in now, which by and large is, is Goldilocks. And so obviously when you get to elevated readings of breadth, like you know 90th plus percentile top decile type readings, you're typically, we are typically on high alert for a phase transition in the short to medium term. And ah, so that's, interesting. Oh, so that often will signal the transition. Yeah, it'll be, it's a leading indicator of a transition. 
to lean um, back. How often are these in kind of uh, order? Goldilocks reflation, inflation, deflation in in bearish to bullish. Is that like a spectrum, or are these just separate categories and the and it bounces from one to the other? All random? Uh, yeah, they're all they're all separate categories. Uh, so Goldilocks <laughs> is typically the most bullish, followed by reflation. Inflation is the most bearish, followed by deflation. Deflation is a mixed bag. Some full exposures, more cyclical exposures, tend to uh, have negative absolute returns in deflation, whereas some growthier exposures, uh, U.S. you know, kind of mega cap quality type exposures, uh, do tend tend to do quite well in deflation. So it's a mixed bag for deflation, but generally speaking, uh, max bullish in Goldilocks, max bearish in inflation. Reflation is a little bit some deflation or somewhere in between. And in terms of um, in terms of what what so what what this it, 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 go taking a step back. At its core, what this model is trying to do is trying to figure out the, the model is trying to figure out what everyone else is trying to price in. You know, it's using their own momentum against them. They being the the folks on the other side of your trades, it's trying to figure out at the margins what are these people trying to do across asset markets. And these are forty two of the most important markets uh, in the world. We're talking things like the move index, the CVIX, the currency volatility. We got things like credit spreads in there. You know, uh, short rates, long rates. You know, credits or, or, or yield curves, et cetera. So there's a lot of information uh, in this table. Uh, in terms of, okay, what is the market pricing in? Let me orient my portfolio into that. And if I'm going to start to rotate my portfolio or build in trade asymmetric trades, bets, I need to understand what is the market likely to price in next. And that's what that's where we bring in things like our weather model and, of course, our fundamental research process. One of the things that just jumps off the page on that last page <clears throat> is all the credit um, scores. There are yeah. big red X's everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's been a great time to be a credit credit investor, <laughs> investor in the fixed income markets. Absolutely. Is that very common where you get a whole, uh, you know, one whole category? There's just nothing but X's? Uh, y yes and no. Um, certainly, we've had a pretty significant phase transition dating back to uh, November of last year. Uh, in terms of the phase transition we've seen uh, in the fit global fixed income markets. And as a function of that, you're seeing a lot of new uh, uh, signal develop. And that's why they're all red X's, because it's a, it's a breakdown from the previous bullish regime in terms of interest rates, the previous bullish regime in terms of uh, in terms of uh, 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 spreads, uh, et cetera. And so that's that's kind of what's what's happening there. Um, and and uh, only because credit has uh, so often been um, a coincident and damaging factor in overall economic activity. And um, since the great financial crisis, we haven't had to worry too much about credit because the banks are so chock full of Perfect. equity capital. Um, what is interesting is the amount of private capital that has been raised on the side that is competing with banks. Are, are you capturing that in this in these tables? Uh, not uh, so the, the the nominal stock of private capital, no, but we we certainly do uh, fundamental research to understand exactly what's <laughs> happening uh, from the perspective of of corporate balance sheets, household balance sheets, et cetera. And uh, what we continue to see is that you know they they have raised a lot of debt, but it's been more of a mix shift. So if you look at uh, you, corporate debt divided by total assets, for instance, it's been pretty much flat for for all, you know pretty much you know the last you know kind of two business cycles. Uh, what's changed at the most, what's changed the most in the last business cycle is a lot of cash that we're seeing on corporate uh, balance sheets. That's up at about 5% of total assets, highest ratio we've seen since the early 50s. And so we're seeing some uh, some some favorable dynamics in the context of the private sector balance sheet uh, that has supported a lot, that's been supported uh, at the margins by and is supporting reflexively uh, the, the kind of private credit functions that we're seeing out there. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we talked about, we don't have to get into this in this particular discussion, but, um, you know, one of the things we outlined in the summer of 2022, uh, Robert, is our resilient U.S. economy theme. And part and parcel to that theme was understanding that U.S. private sector balance sheet dynamics had sort of moved in a way that suggested that a lot of the, 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 the kind of, I don't know, hullabaloo, if you will, around the policy rate is mostly noise because it's not really flowing through to the private sector uh, in, in deleterious ways that it ultimately would, uh, a lot of investors kind of were wrong footed on. Uh, and so that's, um, in my opinion, I think that that theme is still ongoing uh, and why I think that the probability of a soft landing uh, is higher than the probability of a hard landing or a no landing. And this is a similar look uh, on the consumer as well, right? The consumer's balance sheet has gotten, um, was um, filled up in 2021, 22, and even though you get you have rising credit card debt right now, mm -hmm. overall um, danger signs are still pretty pretty muted. 
Very yeah. minute. Very minute. So if you uh, two things I would sh uh, flag on that particular uh, comment, uh, if you look at a household debt divided by nominal disposable personal income, uh, it's at 97 percent or 97 cents on the dollar. That's cyclically depressed relative to prior cycles. Now, obviously, the you know couple cycles ago was a bubble. So we're not necessarily have to get back to that level. But it's telling us that there is uh, room to extend credit uh, for the household sector. But I would argue more important, uh, what is more important typically than the level of, 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 of debt uh, on a ratio basis is the debt service ratio itself. Uh, and the debt service ratio accounts for all the flow through uh, from monetary policy and changes in income, et cetera, uh, as you progress throughout the business cycle. And at 9.8%, we're effectively at an all-time low. Obviously, it was lower during COVID when we're stuff in the channel with uh, free money, but <laughs> but it's effectively at an all-time low. So you're right, uh, your, 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 your assumption that the we've sort of de-risked from the perspective of private sector balance sheets is actually very correct. And one of the reasons why um, you know the economy has just consistently and persistently surprised to the upside. Now, it's not the only reason, but it's certainly one of the key reasons. Well, it is interesting to, that if you're a general consumer of news, boy, they throw a lot of headlines at you to, to try and scare you. And and one of the one of the headlines that was uh, trying to scare everybody because the the data looked pretty scary was the um, the commercial real estate market last year. And then they kind of disappeared from the headlines as interest rates came down. Where do you see that um, as part of the credit? Because the problem there is just the refinancing and the higher rates. Uh, and then the office sector, of course, you have you have a structural problem on occupancy. But what what's your work showing on um, commercial real estate? Yeah, I don't have anything in this particular deck. Uh, so, but the, the in terms of the conclusions of that work, the work was this is not a this is not a big deal. Um, if you look at the exposure. Uh, one, the exposure is pretty de minimis. We're talking about a trillion dollars of total exposure. Uh, obviously, not all of it needs to be refinanced, and certainly not all of it needs to be refinanced tomorrow. Uh, but secondarily, the exposure is concentrated on the balance sheets of banks that are very much not systemically important. Um, so if this is going to be an issue, it's going to be an issue for the borrowers and the banks, the particular borrowers and the particular banks, rather than a broader macro issue for the economy. That's been our conclusion. We're going to stick with that until we start. It to becomes see it. more of a policy issue in Washington that doesn't really have a lot to do with what the economy is going to be doing. A hundred, a hundred percent. Well, it may become because and 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 conversely, perversely, things that become policy issues in Washington tend to wind up with policy solutions out of Washington. Something like the bank term funding program was a, born out of regional banks blowing up. Uh, we got rich from it. I was heading in that direction. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know what happens when you get uh, little skirmishes, wildfires that you have to put out. Um, it's a green signal for the markets. It's it's more liquidity coming into the system. It's losses that are being deferred. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, so ironically, if we wind up with a problem when the BF, BTFP step gets uh, turned off in March, if they turn it off, um, if once that liquidity comes out of the system, if it causes something else, you'll see another program come along and that's that's kind of one of the marks of the of of our of our society over the last i don't know 20 years 100 percent, my friend we can get into a deep deep dive on on, on some of these uh longer term structural pol political dynamics but I, I i i'll reserve that probably for our next time so yeah but... let's get, let's get back into uh into the into the weather model because i think it's a very important um, um tool to help investors understand you know, why our clients are generally on the right side of market risk. We're not always on the right side of market risk. You know, there are phase transitions and, you know, you got to risk manage those appropriately. But, you know, we tend to stay on the right side of market risk because we are implementing this differentiated process on a daily basis, six days a week here uh, at 42 Macro. So I'll start with the um, with the real economy cycle. As a matter of fact, I'll give you an opportunity to um, to see how this uh, this process actually works. So I'll start with the real economy cycles here on the left. And those are organized by growth, inflation, employment, Profits and fiscal policy uh, growth is currently trending higher. Is expected to, to to inflect and trend lower over the next twelve months, according to uh, consensus estimates. Uh, headline CPI is trending lower. Is expected to continue trending lower over the next twelve months, according to uh, consensus estimates. The unemployment rate is currently trending higher. It's expected to continue trending higher over the next twelve months, according to uh, consensus estimates. Uh, if you look at the implied sales growth rate for the equity market, uh, that number is trending lower. The implied earnings growth rate for the equity market is trending higher. Uh, if you look at the sovereign fiscal balance uh, uh, divided by the nominal GDP, that ratio is trending higher now and recently inflected to a, a positive trend. Uh, the dollar real effective exchange rate uh, is trending higher. And so, you know, th that's sort of the, the summary of, of all the what we think are the main indicators to track for the real economy cycles. 
On the right side of the chart, we have the financial economy cycles uh, sort of derived across liquidity, credit, interest rates, uh, and then we uh, identify fear and greed through the lens of aggregated uh, dollar and treasury positioning and aggregated uh, commodity and equity positioning. So let's go down the list here. 42 macro net liquidity is trending higher. Uh, our net liquidity model for those who may be uh, uh, new to us, uh, that's the Fed balance sheet minus the Treasury General account balance minus the reverse removal facility balance. Morgan Stanley made that popular across global Wall Street, but you heard it here first. Um, global liquidity proxy, that's the global central bank balance sheet plus global broad money supply plus global FX reserves minus gold. That's our, our second liquidity model. That's, in fact, a more powerful signal, that number uh, continues to trend higher as well. And the leading indicators for those uh, particular, um, for these two models suggest that we should see at least another quarter or two of positive uptrend uh, in these uh, in these liquidity metrics. Uh, domestic broad money supply uh, is trending lower. Uh, global PPP weighted broad money supply is trending lower as well. So domestic and global credit growth uh, is trending lower. Uh, the benchmark policy rate is trending higher. If you look at what's priced in in a two-year relative to that benchmark policy rate, that's trending lower aggregated dollar positioning. So this is all the major currencies plus gold across uh, versus the dollar uh, in terms of the CFTC non-commercial net length divided by total open interest for all those currencies and in gold. Uh, that minus net 16%. So the dollar is net short. Um, investors are net short the dollar by minus 16% across those instruments. Uh, that's a neutral signal currently. Investors are net short the treasury market across, you know, across the curve. That's an extreme bearish signal. Investors are net short the commodities markets of 19 components of the CRB index uh, to the tune of minus 1%. That's an extreme bearish signal. And then investors are net short uh, all the equity market instruments uh, that the CFTCOT uh, keeps track of uh, to, minus, uh, to the tune of minus 3%. That is a neutral signal. And so each of these signals, Robert, contributes independently to each asset class in the middle of the page. And so what do I mean by contributes independently? Well, let's look at a specific example to understand how the, the tool actually functions. So we'll we'll take it. We'll unpack um, the growth the growth component. These are the two uh, fee component features that we use to to identify you know what where growth is, where the trend to current growth trending growth is, and where it's likely headed over the next uh, twelve months. And so right now we're currently in a positive regime or an accelerating regime for the OECD composite leading indicator, and that historically has produced positive excess returns for risk assets. And so what you see here in terms of these back tests in the second half of the chart, these are excess return back tests relative to this rolling three month forward baseline of returns in, the, in these particular asset classes. So you're typically getting positive excess returns for stocks, commodities, and Bitcoin when growth is accelerating, and you're getting negative excess returns relative to that baseline for, um, for, 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 for the bond market and for the US dollar when growth is accelerating. Uh, conversely, when you look at the right side of the page, we are in a negative, we're a decelerating regime for the uh, real GDP growth delta. Uh, and so uh, we are currently uh, sort of adding this particular uh, back test to those composite signals in the middle of this previous page. And so right now, when you see a negative um, a delta for real GDP growth, uh, you typically are contributing negative excess returns to the stock market, the bond market, commodity market, and crypto market, and positive excess return uh, to the dollar. So this 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 process we are doing, we're, we're now casting the, each of these features six days a week, and we're reporting uh, back into the composite signals, each of the corresponding excess return dispersion back tests uh, that, uh, that correspond to the, to, the, to the current signal. And so when you think about doing this on a daily basis across each of these you know, component features, each of these principal components of macro, you have a lot of information that investors are sort of out there trying to chase with you know, some Bayesian, some you know, procedural, some ad hoc investment process. But everything we're trying to look at as investors and, and, and form um, you know, thoughtful opinions on is actually being now casted into this, into this um, table uh, on a daily basis. Yeah, it's a it's a different model than um, all the strategists I've worked uh, with on Wall Street, who are very good at you know generally assessing what's going on and generally talking about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trust me, I used to I used to sit in that seat, my friend, and uh, and uh, you know, look, it's uh, we we have a hard job, right? You know, like it's hard enough investing well. But then investing well in public and, 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 uh, and hopefully having to be wrong in public, you know, I certainly um, I certainly uh, tip my cap to anyone who's willing to, to do that for a living. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, to me, it's not about being right or wrong in financial markets. My job here is to help 42 micro clients make and save money across market cycles. That, that's it. Period. Point blank stop. And so all the tools uh, that we've introduced, uh, including our weather model and our global macro risk matrix, which is a previous previous tool, those tools generally help us do that better than we otherwise would relying on just my intellect relying on just fundamental research alone in um how many of how many variables did you try and throw out because they didn't work 
Ooh, oh man, you so you want to get into right? topics making hundreds. Yeah, no, this is it took me about three months of just uh, uh trial and error back testing different uh features to actually wind up with the 20 features uh that are, are represented here on the page. Okay. Yeah, and, no, it's, I mean, and then how do these different uh measures uh get weighted differently? Um, uh, for instance, you know, liquidity um at, it, it, casual investors will look at what the Fed is saying and doing and what people are expecting the Fed. And they'll say, that's 90% of the explanation of the S&P. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and it's probably 80% of bonds. Yeah. Um, uh, and But, you know, for the Fed, for example, they control interest rates, but they also control liquidity. And at various times, rates are more important than liquidity. And at other times, liquidity is more important than rates. Mm -hmm. How often do the weightings of each of these categories change? Uh, in theory, <laughs> daily. Uh, not by much daily, but they are. This is a live rolling back test. Uh, so let's let's use liquidity uh, as an example here. So we have our forty-two macro net liquidity model, our global liquidity proxy. So uh, just as an aside, I don't believe in weighting models, uh, and the reason I don't believe in weighting models is because the principal components, uh, the the order of the principal components will change over time. If you do PCA analysis on any discrete period of time, and then start to compare that across, you know, um, you know, on a cross uh, cross sample basis you're going to notice that, hey, all the same principal components are the same, but in this particular period, inflation mattered more. In this particular period, growth mattered more. And so, um, you know, you, you need to rely on a significant amount of hubris as an investor or as a model builder to say that growth should always be weighted X or inflation should always be weighted Y or liquidity should always be weighted Z. How we get around... Yeah. Yeah, or throwing in the subjective judgment that today inflation is going to be 8% instead of 6%. 100%. Right? That's another problem in of itself. 100%. You want, yeah, you want to eliminate the subjectivity. And it also sounds like these self-adjust over time because when they get extreme, the, the indicator will naturally be a little bit higher. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. So this model is perpetually training. It's always training itself. So it's, it's, it's a very rudimentary form of AI. Um, I don't believe in the sexiest forms of AI yet because I don't think anybody understands what they actually what the hell is actually going on. And this is why you don't see everyone waking up and hitting a button on their their stock portfolio. Whatever the AI told me today, I'm going to take my life savings and do that. No, you don't see a lot of people lining up to do that yet for, for obvious and good reason. No, not uh, yet. But that maybe that'll add to the productivity boost that we'll talk about later. <laughs> <laughs> we all just hit a button to do our jobs and go back to watching TV or something. <laughs> watching watching Bills, kickers, miss field goals. <laughs> or watching uh, AI create entertainment for us. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that, that's quite the we're all looking forward to that circular reference. But uh and so uh so just putting a tip any bow on your um, on your question here. So um, you know, just give me a sense of how the model works again. You know, what we're trying to do is identify conditions in these, you know, in the momentum conditions in each of these indicators that actually produce excess returns. So it's one thing to have a, 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 a indicator that's you know fancy and everyone cares about it, but if it does not produce any excess returns, positive or negative going from state to state, condition to condition, then it's a it's a useless indicator. There's no there's no real reason you should be tracking it as a particular indicator. It's really it, it's a better way to say that is it's actually not an indicator. And so right now the let's use the stock market for instance the uh, the when when the forty two macro net liquidity is rising or it's trending higher, it's a positive excess return uh, for the stock market to the tune of plus one point one percent of course the lifetime of this back test. You know twenty years from now. That could be plus two percent, or it could be you know plus zero point five percent. Currently, it has a higher weight than the plus eighty basis point back test that our global liquidity proxy has uh, for the stock market. And so, over time, that plus zero point eight could rise to one point eight or fall to zero point five. And so, that's how the weights are determined. It's about how much excess returns uh, dispersion do you produce for this particular uh, particular uh, asset class. And so that's, in my opinion, that's why I think the model is, you know, again, it's not perfect. We don't purport to build perfect models or have perfect solutions here for our clients at 42 Macro, but we have very good solutions and very good models. And I think the reason this model has been so powerful and, again, helping our clients stay on the right side of market risk is because it is smart. It is learning. You know, it's learning from its own mistakes and, and revising those excess return dispersion back tests appropriately as we move forward through time. Excellent. You're a good teacher. <laughs> ah, thank you, man, my friend. Well, I get paid to do this, so I should be pretty good at it. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned something about inflation that I think is, um, I think it's important to unpack. Uh, you know, uh, trying to say is inflation going to be eight percent or six percent? And and don't get me wrong, 
we, you know, I, I started my career, uh, you know, as kind of as a more traditional kind of economist before I kind of graduated up to the strategist role. And, you know, I've built a, a variety of models that are designed to produce uh, forecasts for GDP, forecasts for inflation, uh, those types of uh, variables. Uh, and the reality is most of those models, whether they be DSG or auto aggressive, they broke in 2020. Um, and there's no way, there's no if, get, there's no getting around the fact that they broke uh, in 2020 because we had a jump condition in a significant number of, of critical economic variables that quite frankly, you couldn't train a model on. If you did train a model on, that just means you would have to admit that your model didn't work for the previous 40 years. And so we are in a new paradigm and we're all scrambling as economists to figure out, okay, what models actually work in this new paradigm in this new kind of higher nominal GDP environment, higher volatility environment in terms of uh, growth and inflation. And ultimately, uh, if, if those models work, you know, what are the appropriate sample sizes and appropriate back testing periods, look back periods to, to train the model on? Those are very much open questions still to this day here in almost four years later, um, or sorry, yeah, really almost four years later in terms of this COVID, uh, post-COVID dynamic and all the fiscal and monetary stimulus that we have to, we're still working our way through. But uh, we've built other models that are a little bit more nonlinear that have helped us, you know, sort of account for some of these dynamics as a function of those old models breaking. And this is one of those models. This is our secular inflation model. What this model is designed to do is interpolate the normalized change of these key indicators upon the underlying trend of inflation. And, and, how, and so what that's designed, so that's effectively trying to say, hey, we had a jump condition in these particular indicators. We should have a similar, on a normalized basis, size jump condition in the underlying time series. And that's what this, this model is designed to do. So what it's saying is that uh, the key summary here, or the key conclusion is that the underlying trend of core PCE is, is was 1.6% uh, in the 2010 to 2019 decade. Based on the normalized, the delta adjusted Z scores here, the normalized change or the jump conditions that are observed in these critical variables that our research and other research has uh, has shown to be you know highly correlated or highly co-integrated with that underlying trend of core PCE over time in different different intervals. We're, our model is saying, hey, we've probably jumped condition to a underlying trend of 2.6% to 3%. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot. And if you're a crypto kid and you're only concerned about hundreds of thousands of percent returns, that doesn't mean anything. But you, Robert, me, Darius Dale, understands that the Fed might not be comfortable with 2.6% to 3% of core PC inflation without you know, some sort of a tacit or, or explicit policy change. And so you know, this is something that has really guided us throughout this kind of decade, or at least the last couple of years, in understanding that, hey, which prob inflation is probably not as transitory as a lot of policymakers think, so that we we, we were golf clap for getting that, that call right back in early 2022 and understanding that, hey, the Fed's probably going to have to tighten a lot more than investors understood uh, at, at that time. Uh, obviously, it's all you know rearview mirror now. But um, And so and the second thing I would say on, on this is that if this model is correct, we're probably going to go to 2% inflation, maybe even hang out there for a little bit, but that's probably the new cyclical low for the time series as opposed to the, the underlying mean of the time series, which is what the Fed is trying to guide to. And at some point in the future, there's going to have to be a reconciliation process that obviously involves more volatility in the fixed income markets. Fascinating. Yeah, we come to we come to a very similar conclusion that, that we've got. And the Fed is going to be uncomfortable with where the inflation rate resides. As oh. soon as the volatility comes out, we get a, a stable read. It's going to be uncomfortably high. So they're going to be on for the economy. It'll be uncomfortably tight relative to an uncomfortably accommodative stance over the last decade. Robert, I love that statement, my friend, because we're already starting to pick that up in our data. And so, as I mentioned, you know, if you think about our process as sort of like a triangle, you know, there's the start, <laughs> start the, the point, the, the, the tip of the spear, that triangle is what the hell are markets trying to price in? That's the top-down market regime process uh, that we use our global macro risk matrix to, uh, to, to identify. The second step of that process is refreshing the weather model and incorporating signal from the principal components of macro back upon the markets to say, hey, is the current regime, like, does it have a high probability of sustaining itself over the next few months? If it does not have a high probability of sustaining itself according to those composite signals for the asset classes, then we need to lean on our fundamental research process, which is you know the third uh, point of the triangle, to say, okay, if it's not going to be in Goldilocks, you know, for an extended period of time, where is it going next? And we use again, this is our fundamental research. So in, in this chart here, we're showing uh, a median CPI, trim mean CPI, the median PCE deflator, the trim mean PCE deflator, and then the core PCE and super core PCE. And uh, the blue bars in each of these panels represent the three-month annualized rates of change. 
the red line in each panel represents the year over year rate of change and the uh, light dotted light blue line in the uh, in the panel each panel represents the 2015 to 2019 trend of the three month annualized bars and so what i'm showing in this in the top panel you should be very concerned as an investor is that we've already bottomed in median cpi on a three month annualized basis and have since reaccelerated to 4.6% which is almost double the pre covid trend we bottomed in trim mean CPI, uh, you know, pretty much right at the pre-COVID trend, and have since accelerated at a couple, maybe hundred basis points or so, to three point four percent. You know, we're seeing similar dynamics in Supercore CPI. So Supercore CPI down here, we bottomed in, I want to say, in June here, and we have since accelerated to four point three percent, which is more than double the pre-COVID trend. So there are signs, emergent signs of what we could call, call sticky inflation here uh, in the U.S. economy. Now. Whether those emergent signs is just a sort of transitory blip, or is it going to turn out to be, well, we actually bottomed a while ago, the red lines, which is what everyone else is, is focused on, the year-over-year -year rates of change, are going to bottom at levels that are inconsistent with not only the Fed's 2% mandate, but also inconsistent with where the Fed has core PC projected to be year in 2024, year in 2025, and ultimately where rates have to be. So there is a potential reconciliation process ahead of us as a market participants if and when the inflation data starts to uh, starts to um, uh, signal that it's um, that it's uh, doing something materially different. But when we look at a broader set of uh, leading indicators on inflation, whether it be the I prices, um, uh, component, prices PMIs in, in the ISM surveys, uh, we look at uh, to the prices uh, indicators in the UMICH and the, and the conference board uh, surveys. We look at the prices components in the NFIB survey, the New York Fed has a pricing uh, 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 survey. There's a lot of leading indicators that suggest the momentum and in inflation is still headed to the downside, at least over the next quarter or so. But then we obviously have to, again, refresh this Bayesian research and risk management process six days a week so that we can spot when those leading indicators are starting to say something different so we can signal that to our clients and say, hey, Goldilocks is about to end. We're probably headed for inflation. Inflation's risk off, do something different. It's it's so interesting to see that during this period of time of reaccelerating inflation that the bond market was actually rallying like crazy. Yeah, 100%. Well, and the 10-year was rallying like crazy. Well, well don't forget don't forget the, the, that's that, that's the leading edge of inflation. The inflation that everyone cares about, and particularly the Fed, core PCE is doing exactly what it what what the bond market wants it to do, which is exhibit a textbook deceleration. You know, we're back down at two point one percent three month annualized for core PCE. We're at one point nine percent six month annualized for core PCE, and that to me tells me that the three point two percent year over year rate is headed lower in the coming months. And so that's what the bond market's anchored on. But, the, but those median CPI statistics, those trim mean CPI statistics, that's kind of show breadth in the same way that our global macro risk matrix is trying to show breadth for that for the markets. Those breadth type indicators are saying, hey, wait up, wait up, wait up. We're getting obviously some very positive things that have higher weight are driving down the main core PCE and that's even it. super core PCE. But the, the, if you look at it from a breadth perspective, you know, the inflation genie is definitely not back in the bottle and ultimately well, in our opinion. And this is what makes markets so much fun when you uncover, you know, indicators that are telling you what's much more likely to happen in the next three months totally. than the market is reacting the last three months about. A hundred percent. And again, this is why we start every morning here, six days a week at 42 Macro with refreshing the global macro risk matrix. Okay, what, what are markets trying to price in? Refresh the, the, the macro weather model. Okay, is what markets trying to price in have a high probability of sustaining itself over the next three months? And then if it does not have a high probability of sustaining itself, I mean, if or not, we're going to do the research anyway, but if it does not have a high probability of sustaining itself, then we need to really lean on our fundamental research to try to help investors pivot or position or prepare to position for uh, the, the eventual transition. And so in my opinion, I think if we're going to exit this Goldilocks regime, it's going to be to inflation and not to deflation because we think the probability of a hard landing is a much lower probability than that of a no landing. One of the headlines last year that um, <clears throat> it wasn't so much a headline as it was an opinion about a minority of economists that with a structurally higher inflation rate, we had and a structurally um, a gigantic budget deficit that we were going to run into a problem of, of uh, supply demand on the treasury front that would keep long-term treasuries elevated, rates, yields elevated for a long period of time. And that really, that that just about peaked right as the bond market was about to have the, one of the biggest rallies of, of, of our lifetimes. Yeah. Um, what, when, at what point does um, 
does that become an issue? What is driving this? Is this the, just that the United States economy is so strong that it's pulling capital in from everywhere? Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't go that far. Uh, I think what's driving the, the move in the bond market is the fact that we're having some very positive outcomes on inflation. I mean, this, you know, yeah. so we just showed you the, the 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 textbook disinflation we're seeing in core PCE, the textbook disinflation we're observing in in super core uh, PCE. That should, you know, we, we're, we're headed we're headed to at least two and a half percent on year over year super core PCE in the next quarter or two if these numbers continue to hang out where they are or even bounce lower. And so that's you know that's in my opinion that's what the bond market is anchoring on because ultimately what it means is what Jay Powell confirmed in December, which is if inflation continues to do what we think it's going to do, we have to cut rates. From a technical perspective, in order to avoid uh, kind of um, uh, implementing uh, incrementally tighter monetary policy. Now, there is an obviously an open debate on how tight monetary policy actually is. We started from the perspective in summer of 2022 that it's not going to be very tight because all the they're basically it's basically a side sideshow now. Obviously, it's going to really impact borrowers at the margins, but there's so many positive things going on from the perspective of the hyper financialized U.S. economy that effectively make that kind of policy tool increasingly less relevant. And I'll throw a statistic out there for you for for for, for in terms of in support of that. Uh, if you look at the share of private non-financial sector credit that is on bank balance sheet in the US versus off bank balance sheet, it's only 33% that's on bank balance sheet. The other 67% is being created by non-bank financial market participants. That share, that that 67% share is way higher than what you see in the Eurozone, what you see in China, what you see in Japan. And so in our opinion, when asset markets are in Goldilocks, which is what our global macro research is, is telling us, the credit machine here in the U.S. is on irrespective of where the level of rates are, because there's there's a ways and ways around that from a, from a, um, from a rehypothecation standpoint. Yes. Um, you talked about in your liquidity work, you talked about um, government source liquidity, which is both fiscal and monetary, and then also private sector liquidity. What is that private sector liquidity? And are we looking at the relative um, portions of it? Uh, how, is, when government's turned on, is it does it dwarf private sector? How, how do those work? Yeah, 100 percent. So it's all about the speed. So and on a stock basis, private sector liquidity is higher. So if, in terms of you break open, if you break open our, our, our 42 macro global liquidity proxy uh, into its components, the global central bank balance sheet. So this is the major, the combined balance sheet of the major central banks in dollar terms. This is the combined money stock, uh, broad money supply of each of those economies in, in dollar terms. And then this is the combined uh, uh, share, uh, combined, uh, nominal sum of global FX reserves minus gold for each of those uh, economies. So on a, on a stock basis, Money supply, the private sector liquidity is much higher than than the combined shares of of, of 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 what we call public sector liquidity. However, at times, public sector liquidity can grow much faster or decline much faster than private sector liquidity. So it's very important as an investor to be a to be be aware of this because I'm not sure a lot of investors are aware that. You need to track liquidity from its various uh, component sources, but two, understand the leading indicators and the drivers of fluctuations in these in these particular statistics. You know that's something we do a lot of statistical work on here at Forty Two Macro because it's not enough to just you know do what everyone else is doing on Twitter, which is telling you liquidity's up, therefore Bitcoin should be up, or liquidity's down, therefore the stock market should be down. That's that's not really an investment process because it's not forward looking. And to be forward looking about these dynamics and ultimately make and save money with this information, you need to understand what drives liquidity. And so, for things that are have a, a, a lead, you know, leading edge in terms of um, protecting uh, the the private sector liquidity, it's things like the U.S. dollar, it's things like bond market volatility, it's things like currency volatility, because those things, you know, typically are when they decline, those things are supportive for that, you know, non bank financial market liquidity uh, creation function. And if you're trying to track public sector liquidity provision, uh, if you want to front run that, you need to see things like inflation decline, you need to see things like unemployment uh, rise. Uh, et cetera. So, you know, we, we are constantly monitoring, you know, trends and levels and and and, and momentum in those indicators. Uh, and so in, in relaying them back to, okay, what's leading, what's lagging, what's coincident to understand, hey, we should be getting this much, we should be getting more or less liquidity from this particular um, feature, from that particular feature, and then from the other feature. So it's a, it's a complicated process at times, but the, the real summary and the neatness of, of the, you know, how we think about liquidity in a holistic standpoint goes back to our, our model. You know, we know that liquidity is trending higher, both domestically and globally. We understand the, the leading indicators for why liquidity is trending higher domestically and the leading indicators for why liquidity is trending higher globally. And therefore, we have some confidence that the current uptrend in liquidity in both of these features should be persistent for at least the next month or two. Now, again, 
we're not in the business of predicting the predictors. If these arrows, down arrows inflect down tomorrow, we're going to ride with however they impact the, the composite sectors. You know, but, you know, we, obviously when we're having conversations with clients, you know, we try to give them as much nuance as possible so they can structure their trades appropriately. How about um, factors that people think impact markets that um, are um, not core to the economy or this, for instance, geopolitical or um, or the changing uh, dynamics of large portions of the rest of the global economy, China, Europe? emerging markets, where do those factor in here and how often do they, how often are they the dog and how often are they the tail? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's, it's all, quite often, quite often they're uh, the dog and not the tail. Uh, so, you know, again, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make a blanket statement like geopolitics doesn't matter, but I will say it doesn't matter if it does not impact one of these three things. Growth. I, yeah, I, I think, I mean, it really is. There's probably never been a better year than last year to know that geopolitics doesn't matter. A hundred percent. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Absolutely. No, it's, it's when geopolitics has a direct influence on growth, inflation and or policy, then it matters. However, until, until that point, the markets are, are very correct to ignore it. Uh, because again, what we've known, I mean, you don't need me to get on here and tell you that growth, inflation, and policy are principal components of, of asset market returns. We all can agree and agree on that, you know, without having to go to the library and, and do a, a big statistical study. Uh, you know, so what we're talking about in terms of geopolitics, you know, kind of just putting a bow on this, it's just, you know, for something like the, uh, I'm using the, um, uh, the the Houthi rebels as, as an example. You know, they're obviously causing ships to divert from the Red Sea, et cetera. It's potentially causing, freight, it is causing freight rates to rise. We're seeing a pretty significant rise on freight rates. But it has yet to really materially impact, you know, crude oil prices. Crude oil is still uh, neutral from the perspective of our volatility adjustment momentum signal. It has not really impacted global agricultural prices. Those are still neutral. But uh, uh, base metals prices are actually declining. Uh, so, you know, we're not really seeing it uh, impact uh, uh, the leading indicators of reported inflation in these particular economies, economies which is obviously a leading indicator uh, for policy in certain respects. And so we're a long ways away from geopolitics mattering. And now it's not to say it won't ever matter. But it's only going to matter in uh, up uh, with, up until the point, or it's going to matter when it starts to actually impact uh, one of these three uh, kind of principal components. Yeah, if the trade issue and um, particularly with oil, uh, you know, continue to uh, occur, you are going to see upward pressure on, you know, the cost structure going through, and there it will be modest inflation on goods, mm -hmm. and you'll see modest inflation on energy. If it if if it, <laughs> it is pretty surprising that you could. You could shut down shipping in the Red Sea and not see oil prices go up a lot. Yeah, no, I mean, my theory on this, right, is is I th the market is calling OPEC's bluff, right? I, we don't, I mean, I'm not an energy analyst, so like I, I, I'm going to run out of things to say really quickly here. But th it's very clear to me that the market is effectively saying, ha ha, you guys have all cut too much. You can't cut anymore. You know, the supply is coming back. You can't keep cutting because you guys have, you know, mouths to feed effectively. That's what the market to me is telling me. Yeah, that's interesting. That that makes a lot of sense. So you um, mentioned, oh, sorry, I didn't want to. No, go ahead. No, USA, you mentioned China. So I was going to say, let's yep. do a quick rundown of China and then uh, we can kind of open it up. Uh, so, you know, what we're trying to do in this table is, you know, this is our kind of starting point for thinking about geographic dispersion, both in terms of the performance of the economies, but also in terms of performance of, of asset markets. And so, you know, just kind of going across the table, we see that Chinese growth is trending lower. Uh, it's below trend. Uh, that's the lagging indicator, GDP, is trending lower in terms of the um, the, uh, the leading indicator as well, the PMI. That's also below trend. The unemployment rate's trending higher, uh, still below trend, so that's positive. Uh, econ surprises have been persistently negative in China and getting worse. Uh, if you look at headline CPI is sipping over into inflation, it's trending lower in outright deflation and well below trend. Core CPI is trending lower, uh, flirting with outright deflation and well below trend. And then inflation surprises uh, were deeply negative in China, although getting slightly less negative at the margins. In terms of policy, uh, Chinese liquidity proxies are um, um, rising because we, you know, we continue to see uh, positive uh, uh, sort of liquidity dynamics from the uh, from the uh, both the public and private sector uh, in China. It's not broken out in this particular chart. Uh, the policy rate's been trending sideways, uh, and it's it's below trend. The the fiscal balance has been trending lower, although it's likely to trend higher if you, based on the, uh, the 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 target that we got a couple of weeks ago from the the Central Work Committee here. So it's heading towards three uh, percent. So that's going to be moving in the wrong direction in terms of supporting uh, asset markets there. Uh, and then the current account deficit or current account balance 
uh, is trending lower. And at 1.8%, it's about as low as it's been. Uh, and, and, and and be really in you know, really since the modern China joined the WTO uh, back in 2001. And then uh, the real effective exchange rate, that number is trending lower and is well below trend. So it's ultimately telling you that uh, there's obviously a capital outflow situation uh, uh, in China. And so that's kind of the starting point to think about China. Growth is, is trending lower, well below trend. Inflation is trending lower and effectively flirting with deflation. There is a muted policy response, uh, but it's obviously not being uh, overwhelming and forceful enough. And part of the reason we don't think it's uh, overwhelming and forceful enough is that we, you know, continue to see some real kind of headwinds on China in terms of the Chinese balance sheet dynamics that are preventing uh, it, them from being uh, forceful enough. This chart here shows private and often intersector credit to GDP ratios uh, for the Chinese economy in red, for the Japanese economy here in black, the Eurozone economy, the UK economy, uh, sorry, US economy in the blue, uh, Indian economy and Brazilian economy. And as you can see at 228% of uh, GDP, Chinese private and often intersector debt is this high as it is in the world across all these major economies. And more importantly, um, the Chinese uh, not uh, private sector, or sorry, uh, debt service ratio at 21% uh, is much higher than all the major economies as well. So what that ultimately means is Beijing, obviously well aware of all these dynamics we just highlighted in terms of you know growth and inflation being structurally depressed, policy kind of not responding of, uh, to that. I think the reason they're not responding is because they know they're pushing on a string from the perspective of these debt and credit uh, dynamics. You know, we keep saying that, hey, you can do as much countercyclical stimulus as you want in China. And yes, you will have a, a, a fleeting rebound in growth and a fleeting rebound in inflation, i.e. Uh, reflation is what, what that would be in, in economic terms. But it's going to be fleeting until you implement structural reforms. But the problem is China wants to implement uh, structural reforms. Because if they implement a structural reforms, they're effectively going to have to. That, all that means is you're just moving, you're rearranging the deck chairs in the economy. And rearranging the deck chairs in the Chinese economy would effectively amount to, you know, taking money out of state-owned enterprise coffers and taking money from away from local governments and pushing into the household sector. And obviously, the party uh, don't want to see that uh, outcome uh, just yet. Yeah, I worked at CLSA for a while, and um, and this was what, you know, all the headlines that. Um, that talk about China as a rising power and a threat to us uh, really don't didn't um, take into full account how much indebtedness that entire economy has, and it's uh, it's it's it. There is a real problem when the growth is rolling over, um, because in the I think in the old days they were getting better growth unit out of every unit of stimulus than they are now. And, 100%. Because that means, unfortunately, they're, they're, I think we are too, but we are, have a totally different economic situation that at least well, we is we strong. we we don't forget about uh, we we have a we have a government down in D.C. that has been full in, all in on on socialization really since two thousand eight, and, and that's kind of the key takeaways. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with my former colleague Neil Howe, who's a mentor of mine, uh, and his, his concept of the fork turning you know, which is this generational cycle that, you know, kind of creates a lot of, you know, sort of, um, you know, big, creates big, one of the many things it creates is big government uh, and, and, and sort of in response to some of these um, political dynamics. And so in the context of all the socialization we've seen in our country, of course, we're doing better than China. You know, socialization works. That's what China proved in the previous two decades. It works, but there's a, you know, logical, um, you know, kind of end game uh, for that. And I think China, I wouldn't necessarily say China has reached the end game because there's more things they can do but they are a lot closer to the end game than they were 20 years ago. Well, one of the things about your model is, uh, you know, the liquidity coming from the monetary and fiscal. Um, yeah, if you just turn it on, it's 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 a real great <laughs> drug for the markets and yeah. the economy. It but really at some point, it's not going to be such a good such a good drug. There's just huh. there, if huh. it's if it's always good, uh, you know. So far, we're 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 living as if we think it's always good, no matter what. Hundred percent. I completely agree with you, my friend. And that's what liquidity is, right? Liquidity <clears throat> picks the can down the road. I mean, think about it from the perspective of your credit card or your mortgage. The more liquidity allows you to kick the can down the road. And so that's what mar markets like that. But, you know, it's not our job to, to sit here and pontificate on what is good or better or bad for society. Yeah. I really don't care. My job is to help 42 macro clients make and save money on a consistent basis across market cycles. And, you know, knock on wood, we've been doing a great job of that. Well, um, I see that we're almost out of time. There was one topic uh, that I don't know if you can do justice to that I loved about your work. And that was um, suddenly earlier this year, things changed a lot. And you said, that's because of productivity. <laughs> it went from this <laughs> to this. My favorite chart right now, my friend. I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through it. 
I remember the, the, the question was, um, so, you know, what's productivity going to do? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, I think, I think your it's, answer is worth you saying it, not me. <laughs> it's, it's one of the most important charts in macro, my friend, because, uh, so yep. going back to, uh, late October, early November, uh, we pivoted to a, a tactical bullish stance in the markets, uh, out of our previous bearish regime, because we understood that the positioning cycle dynamics were so extreme that we have to, you had to, you had to take the other side of the bearish bet. And that obviously proved out well for us because we ultimately transitioned to a, positive, you know, a risk on market regime uh, in that process. And one of the things that caused us to make that initial determination in late October and early November was the bounce that we saw in productivity, because we understood at the time that, hey, it's going to force people into the soft landing camp. And that's that probability in market implied terms was very low at the time. It's obviously quite high now. And so we saw this big bounce in productivity growth. What I'm showing in this top panel is the time series of year-over-year -year productivity growth. We show the 10-year uh, moving average. We show the 30-year uh, moving average and the 50-year moving average, and they're all coalesce around kind of 1.7%. So you think about U.S. economy, you know, it's about a 1.7% productivity. It's about 20, 30 basis points of working age population growth. You know, you slap, you clap your hands and you move on. That's that's kind of how we get to be a 2% economy. What yeah, the reason I like the way productivity is kind of a result of a whole lot of other factors, and it's not something that you can actually watch move 100%. Have a, an exact answer on what's going on. Yeah. And so we can only keep our fingers crossed that this might look like the 1990s. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that's the key takeaway from this chart, right? And and so you you hit your nail on the head, you hit the nail on the head. Productivity and inflation economists have really no idea how to truly forecast it. We can build models that can tell you where it's likely to be, but it's not a real, you know, genuine first principles type forecast because we it don't. It almost know. kicks out of as, as a result of everything else. It's like 100%. The, the it's a residual. factor at the end. Oh, and look it's, at what productivity is. It's a residual. And so, um, uh, but it's an important residual because ultimately it's the path to a soft landing. And so what I'm showing in this chart, the black, the, the red dotted lines correspond to all the hard landings uh, after a Fed uh, policy rate tightening cycle. As you can see, there are uh, mostly red dotted lines. There's two green dotted lines uh, that correspond to the uh, 1980s soft landing uh, and the 1990s uh, soft landing. And so how do you get a soft landing in the economy after the Fed has obviously um, you know, effectively tried to slow the economy into uh, sometimes into a recession to, to defeat inflation? You need to have two things happen. You need to have the Fed acknowledge that it wants a soft landing by pivoting to rate cuts, which is exactly what the Fed has outlined it's going to do uh, throughout 2024. And you probably need to have either some combination of above trend fiscal spending. That's what the, uh, this, uh, this, this chart down here in this panel here shows uh, government purchases and investment on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, as you, in the light blue dotted line just shows the long-term time, I mean, of that time series, you know, back in the mid eighties, when we had the soft landing, we had the Fed cutting rates and we had way above trend uh, of fiscal spending, uh, the growth rate of fiscal spending. Back in the mid nineties, we didn't have uh, the fiscal spending uh, support, but we had a massive productivity boom uh, that, in our opinion, was you know in part driven by the capitalization associated with the internet. And so I'm not here to tell you that AI is going to be smaller or bigger than the internet, but I I am here to tell you that it is a thing, and a lot of people think it's a thing. And if it has to happens to be anything like the internet, maybe even to some, a smaller degree, it's going to sustain a level of productivity uh, that's probably at or slightly above trend. Uh, which is exactly how you can potentially get into a, a soft landing because we already have above trend government spending and we know Fed is probably going to take uh, interest rates lower over the you know kind of medium to long term. Well, and especially if that chart of productivity in the 1990s was internet related, as you point out, it was it was the investment in the internet, not necessarily the result you, of the internet. And 100%. that's what we um, are, we're definitely seeing capital flowing into AI. So that might be part of the explanation there. 100%, my friend. So like I said, we're not in the business of you know predicting all these economic outcomes and all this stuff. It's our job to help investors position for the current market regime and position for the next market regime when it's time to position for that. That's If you keep doing that process daily, you don't need to know where productivity is going to be in 2026 or That's 2027. Right. You know, it's a, there we'll is, I'm going to let you go because it's it's your time to leave. Oh. I know you've got something to go to. Yes. Thank you so much. I hope everybody enjoyed this. Um, uh, I certainly did. And uh, great, great insights. Thank appreciate you, you, brother. I appreciate good you. Man. Look forward good to continuing our conversation. Likewise, brother. Be good. Take care.